welcome into the stage, first of all, Pete Cox. And luckily, we've got a gearbox for you out the back, Thank Pete. Goodness. We're going to be doing a live seminar. <laughs> Not really. We wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here, and uh, let's bring uh, Pete, if you want to come round this side, so I'll sort of stand in between the two of you. Let's, uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Buckles, let's uh, talk about how you two first got together. How did it all begin? Well, at the, the first meeting that we held here, there was a guy called Bob Knowles, who... Uh, worked at Wilsdon College of Technology and they had a printer so he was editor of the newsletter and he wrote it all and printed it all delivered it to us at the committee meetings and we sat down and hand wrote 150 envelopes and everybody was given 30 to post on their way home from the committee meeting and at the first meeting, a guy called Jim Paling was made spares secretary, and he never came to another meeting, he was never seen again. But Bob Knowles decided I should be spares secretary because he didn't know about Pete Cox because he lived miles away in Birmingham. And uh, then Pete and I started corresponding, and we had to correspond because he didn't have a phone. Uh, still doesn't, we didn't answer it, but that's okay. Uh, so, uh, Pete was, you know, in Birmingham in those days, a spark plug at a retail price of five bob, but everybody knew someone who worked at the Austin and you paid a shilling or one and six for a spark plug, whereas in London you were paying five shillings. And I noticed that, and there's a way of making money out of that. You buy spark plugs in Birmingham and sell them in London. And that's how we got together over the first year or so. And I know, Pete, you have a particular talent in that not only do you remember part numbers, especially for half shafts on TR2s, which I know you know off... There we go. Told you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, front grills on three A's? Uh, 802174. Uh, anyone else got any more you want to challenge him? Rear wing TR4. Rear wing TR4. 850475 is the left hand and 476 is the right hand. <laughs> But if it's for a TR5, it's an 811-990 and an 811-991 because they've got the little hole in for the marker light that sits on the rear. The front wing for a TR4 is 950109 and the uh, TR4A, which has a hole in, and it's the same as the 5, was uh, 908389 and 908390. Welcome, ladies. <laughs> I told you, you wish you'd never asked now, didn't you? You see why he's a babe magnet, yeah. don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I do know as well, Pete, as well as remembering all the part numbers, you also remember who your first customer was at Cox and Buckles, because they had a very similar address to yours. Uh, no, no, you're, the, you're confusing two things. The first guy I had a customer was a guy called John Berry, who... Uh, worked at Castle Donington and he ran a company called Beribo Replica Automobiles. He was making MGBs with AC Cobra body shells on them, made in plastic, needless to say. But we, uh, Pete Wigglesworth and I, who worked together, we had a customer called Richard Poor, and my shop was at 51 London Road, Tooting, and Richard Poor lived at 51 Old London Road, Brighton. So it wasn't too difficult to remember. And, uh, Pete, uh, you are known throughout the land as the man who knows how to build TR gearboxes. Sometimes, yeah. How did that all come about? Well, it's, luckily, it's a very short story. Back in 1968, I was uh, working in University of Birmingham, building what you call uh, prototype models for uh, well, auto analyzers and uh, fairly complicated... Uh, scientific equipment. We used to sell the models when they were finished and the university used to get a, a, a back payment from it. And somebody latched onto this and he said, you can build an auto analyzer, can you repair my TR3 <laughs> gearbox? And uh, that was back in 1968 and um, it got a broken second gear bush, I do remember it. So the bill, including the labour, was 17 and 6. And for you youngsters out there, that's 87 and a half P. And it never came back under warranty, so it, it went from there, <laughs> and works. it's never stopped since. 
is in the audience. Is he? It's, uh, it's somewhere the, out there, yeah. The, the bastard, he's brought it back. <laughs> so I'll give him the 87 and a half pence. <laughs> but but you, when, we, we, when we ran the shop in Bur I know we, this is a, a leading on a few years, but when we ran the shop in Birmingham, I employed two other people and we were building five gearboxes a day, six days a week, and by Saturday afternoon we'd always run out. I'd, I did supply London for a while as well, but most of them went from the Birmingham shop. I never told Pete about all of these, but... Uh, <laughs> well, anything after five o'clock was for me, wasn't it? <laughs> well, of course, you were very successful in racing as well. I think it was 1985 you won the championship. 86. 86. Yep. One year out, as Ken Bruce says on the radio. Um, but uh, that was where Cox and Buckles really um, changed from being the guardian of parts are then sort of sponsoring activities within the club as well. And of course, ended up being what we now know as Moss. Yeah. Tell us about your best memories of those early days of Cox and Buckles providing this motley lot out here with parts and keeping TRs on the road. Well, there, there were some strange memories really. I mean, the, the one that I remember most was that we used to gradually open, first of all, it was three days a week in Birmingham, and then it became three and, a, and so on till we got to six days and then somebody who should be nameless decided we'd stay open late on Thursday night as well and the it's thing what <laughs> ah you see and um, we used to employ a chap who was very indistinguishable from the floor in the shop remember pick uh, what's his name picking um, he anyway drove the transit and he used to get later and later and on one Thursday night he arrived about nine o'clock and he said I'm late I'm not staying out I'll leave it on the pavement and you can shift it in yourself well it was about 11 o'clock when I'd emptied the contents of a transit van into my shop so I drove home in the Cox and Buckles works Ford escort van fell asleep wrapped it around an oak tree and uh, I, I learned a good lesson from that one yeah, but um, we, we did slightly reduce the hours after that, but it yeah. was, that was a, a, an amusing memory. And the only person who didn't know about it was my wife. <laughs> she said, you were late last night. And I said, was I? I don't remember that. <laughs> and uh, she, she, never, she never, well, actually, she did learn about it because people in the village, I lived in Rowney Green then, um, they approached her and said, is he all right? I was, and she said, what do you mean? What's happened? She said, well, his van's down in this lane, pestilence lane it was called, and it was there for about three days before they could pull it away from the, from the oak tree. Amazing. And the, my head left a dent in the roof, but I didn't felt a thing. <laughs> that was a good memory. Well, it's like Terry said earlier, you get involved in the TR register and activities, you end up in a van, and you nearly ended in a van. I did nearly <laughs> end in a van, yeah. Uh, Pete, in those early days you had lots of different um, positions in the TR register, but it all got very busy when Cox and Buckles took off, of course. But how did you find all those parts in those early days when it was so difficult? Well, what you've got to learn is that Triumph, for example, didn't worry about calipers and caliper pistons, but Girling still did. So if you had a Girling dealer, you could buy a caliper piston, which is a 157671 in Triumph. But it's a 6432556 as a girling number. And you could buy them. And, and TR2 wheel cylinders happen to be the same as Morris Minor and Frog Eye Sprite and the drum brake MGAs. And they're GWC 110 and 111. But in a Lockheed number, they're 35,000 and 35,001. And they're all available still to this day. Well, probably the, the Lockheed ones aren't available, but they're available here, there and everywhere. But our biggest coup was actually when we met here in, in 1970, someone said, you can't get quarter panels for TR3s anymore. And the quarter panel is the bit down by the rear wing, and it always goes rusty at the bottom. And, and the Triumph factory decided they didn't want to sell them. So we decided that we'd get them made. And I found a place in Reading called Ad West Engineering, and they had a rubber press, and we made them. And we sold literally thousands of them. And that was, and then they made the floors for us, and they made rear wings, and they made inner rear wings and boot floors. And, 
and it, it transformed the availability of parts for the TR3, which by 1975 from the factory was almost zero. Well, brilliant stories that we'll get into. More detail on tomorrow. We have a little bit more time and we're not interrupting the first courses. But for now, for the people that started the parts movement to preserve the Mark TR within the TR register, the founders of Cox and Buckles, Pete Cox and Pete Buckles, big hand. So while the, uh, they get on with their soup or whatever their starter course was, like, come on, Daryl, you can't have your soup now. You've got to, you've got to sing for supper now. Up you come. Up you come, Alex. <laughs> to interrupt his soup, because what I really want to hear about, and I'm sure everyone would like to reminisce with you, Daryl, is the early days of starting what is now the backbone of the TR Register, which was the local group scene. Tell us about those early days and when you started Thames Valley Group and, and what motivated you to do it. Well, the motivation was um, partly alluded to by Terry when he said that we were flashing our lights at one another, but nobody could talk. So um, he did the right thing when he got us writing and understanding with, with uh, knowing addresses and knowing where people lived in the locality. As it happens, I lived at Sunbury-on-Thames, so you're right, it was perhaps the, uh, the centre of the known TRs. And... Um, uh, I got together with a couple of local people, um, initially Pete Hunt and uh, John Davis, Ian Cornish and um, Dave Stotter. Now, all of those people were at the inaugural meeting of the Thames Valley Group. The reason we decided to have, to have a meeting was for exactly the same reason as the register formed, and that was that we wanted to talk about TRs. And if we were going to wait for six or eight or nine months for the next official committee meeting or whenever it was going to be, we'd still be flashing lights and doing nothing else. So we thought the Weir Hotel um, on, on the Thames was a nice venue. We, we sent out some local um, leaflets to people, and I think it was the 2nd or the 3rd of June um, in 1970, we all met at the Weir. Now, politics in the TR register are never far from the surface. And I can tell you... No. That, I can tell you that even by June 1970, there was issues with the committee. <laughs> <coughs> I'm a very easygoing guy. <laughs> and, and it was rumoured that we were charging 10 pence for people to attend the meeting and that we were going to be a breakaway group from what was going to be the TR register. And the committee, led by God rest his soul, who was secretary, Alan Robinson, um, phoned me and said, um, Darrell, I understand, or the committee understand that you're going to have a breakaway group called the Thames Valley Group. We're very unhappy about this. We don't think it should go ahead and we want to understand what your motives are and what you're doing at these um, secret meetings. So, and this is absolutely true, I said, Alan, uh, he, he requested to attend so he could officiate and uh, report back to the committee. I said, Alan, you're very welcome, but I can tell you, if you turn up at the meeting, we're going to throw you in the river. <laughs> he never did turn up and uh, from then on the groups went from well I say the groups Thames Valley group went from strength to strength it was at that group that um, Ian Cornish well of course Ian had a TR4 which um, <laughs> so he's lucky he didn't get thrown in the river himself I was very very much against wind up window cars <clears throat> and I still am um, but anyway... We've um, got his room number. Ian, Ian said to me, come on, Darrell, come in this TR4. It's got a limited slip diff in it. And it's 4VC, and it's supposed to be a works car. And it was a pretty tatty machine, I can tell you. So I went out in it, and I didn't know what a limited slip diff was. I've started to realise what they are now. Um, 
and it just seemed to be a load of noise coming from the back end, but it seemed to excite Ian considerably. Um, and so that's where the first group meeting started at the Weir Hotel. When I moved jobs, I moved to Derby and started the second group, which was the Trent group. And uh, from the displays tomorrow, I have bought a lot of um, sort of archive stuff that's initial group photographs, films. There's a lot of stuff for the local people of the time. Uh, and I know, for example, that Dave Stotter is here tonight, and I'm really pleased that you're, you're still coming. I remember that very tall blonde girl that you brought with you with the uh, knee-length white leather boots. <laughs> so um, so I, don't, I don't remember your TR, but I understand it was a TR3. <laughs> anyway, I started the Trent Group with Frank Richardson and um, people who were working for Rolls-Royce, and I think on the inaugural meeting of the Trent Group, five cars turned up, one me and four others. But um, really, from then on, obviously I did a lot of work for the Register doing many, many things, starting um, Lands to John O'Groats runs, which is all from the groups, really. Round Britain runs, Jubilee runs, championships, you name it, I've probably done it. And then, was, as Graham said, I was uh, president for a couple of terms. Um, but I think that's enough of groups, if that gives everyone a grounding of where they all came from. And it's really good that at least four or five of the original members of the Thames Valley group who turned up on that day are here tonight. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Darrell.